Welcome to the Too Busy to Eat Show. I'm Greg Zaffalato, the host of this show. Today, we have fascinating guests with a fascinating journey. Uh, Murray Carter of Carter Cutlery. He um, started this company a number of years ago, um, but it was born out of his journey when he was 18. Uh, he went to Japan on his own. Now, I'm not going to give you all the pieces of it. I want you to hear the interview, but fascinating story where he ended up becoming, um, in the, he's se- 17th generation Yoshimoto bladesmith, which a guy from North America, uh, born in Canada to go to Japan and that to happen is pretty interesting. His story is fantastic and he's a, just a really interesting uh, person. So let's get to Murray and hear his story. Well, welcome, Murray. I am excited to have you on the show. Um, I can't wait to share your story with um, with our listeners. How are you doing today? Well, thank you, Greg. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here, and uh, it's a, I guess it's an interesting story to tell. It, it is. It is. I know you've told it and you've lived it. So, but for me, it was fascinating reading about you and learning um, just your journey. So that's it's it's um, you mentioned it's unique. Uh, fascinating and unique, I think, are two things that come to mind when I think about your journey. But so why don't you give us a little bit? I know it because I've been reading about you and stalking you a little bit to figure out what, what you're about. But what, uh, why don't you give us a little background of, uh, or give your background, your kind of journey to where, what took you to where you are today? Yes. Well, uh, growing up in Eastern Canada, we had very little uh, interaction back in the 70s with the Orient. Right. Geographically, Nova Scotia, Canada, where I was born and raised, was on the exact opposite side of the globe. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And uh, yeah. I guess it probably wasn't until uh, Shogun, uh, James Clavel's Shogun, aired on TV that uh, I really had any kind of exposure to the Japanese culture. So when that TV series, Shogun, aired, uh, it was kind of my first exposure to the Japanese culture. And, uh, you know, the kind of exotic nature of it intrigued me. It was so unlike anything I had lived or seen or experienced that uh, I was very attracted to it. When I, uh, when I was 15 years old and uh, witnessed my first martial arts competition, uh-huh. I felt like that was a calling and that I needed to enroll in karate classes yeah. and start a practice of martial arts. That naturally, uh, because it was Japanese karate, that piqued my interest even more into right. things of a Japanese nature. I started reading a lot of books, novels, and, uh, and uh, non-fictional biographies and you know a bit about the history and especially books about martial arts and where they were uh, geographically connected to different parts of japan and uh finally i hatched a plan to just go visit japan for myself and see what it was all about and that was i mean that's pretty brave of you because it was pretty you're pretty young when you went to japan oh are you kidding me i was 18 years old and i figured i knew everything there was to know about life (laughs) That's, I don't know if, um, yeah, I, I don't know if I could leave the state when I was 18. No, I, I, I did. But, but that's pretty big to go around the world at, uh, at 18. Well, you know, I had drank my first beer and I had had my first kiss. I figured, that's, what more is there in life to discover? Those are the big ones. So, yes, yeah, so going to Japan is <laughs> <was> nothing. <laughs> so while you were there, there's some, you had a unique experience while you were there. Well, uh, I don't even know which unique experience to start with, but probably the most uh, formative uh, that kind of was most responsible for dictating how the 18 years in Japan would uh, uh, reveal themselves was when I was in Japan the first month studying karate and I dislocated my left knee. Oh, Oh my gosh. And this was this was a big shock, a big setback. It, it kind of dashed my hopes of being the next Jackie Chan or Bruce Lee. <laughs> and uh what actually happened was I started to study the language right. uh, because I was immobile. <laughs> Nothing else you could do. You That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so during that time, now you were you were there 
Um, what, what actually, what was the, what brought you there? I mean, I know it was the martial arts, but were you with an organization? Were you traveling with, the, with a, a group? I actually traveled uh, to Japan and had planned the subsequent round the world tour uh, all by myself. Wow. And I had planned to travel by myself. But since I was already involved with a, a very specific karate organization, the stay in Japan revolved around studying at the main headquarters for that style of karate. So I actually yeah. had yeah. a destination right. to go visit and stay at yeah. for the initial six month stint okay. while I was in Japan. Uh, great. Okay, that makes that makes sense. But you you were you were <laughs> definitely. On, I mean, you. This was your doing. You're on. You weren't signed up for. A, it wasn't a a, a a group adventure. You were. You did it on your own. Plan on your own. But then you hooked up to to the group when you got there. That's pretty. That's right. It's even more impressive. Yeah. No. No chaperones. No guides. No groups. Yeah. yeah. Totally on my own. Yeah. And then while you were there, I know. Obviously, at, at 18, um, that's a pretty traumatic injury. Um, and while you're there, you get laid up. So you start learning the language, but then you said you had a unique experience that led you down the path you are today. Now, what, what was that? Uh, yeah, pretty much uh, one of those, uh, first days well before I dislocated yeah. my knee, which happened uh, like a, a month into the trip. Okay. I think the first day I was in Kumamoto, which is where I was staying with the karate dojo. Uh, I was zipping around the city of Kumamoto exploring on a little scooter <laughs> that had been lent to me by one of the other students at the karate dojo. And while exploring, I saw this fascinating building that had, uh, you know, this big display case outside the building with knives inside it and so on, huge knives. And uh, it just out of the corner of my eye, I knew I had seen something, uh, 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 almost like one of those fateful scenes fateful encounters. Yeah. And without really making a conscious decision, I did a U-turn, came back and pulled into the building and, and uh, just really kind of fearlessly ventured in and uh, not knowing what was going to unfold. Right. 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 So what did, what, what did unfold? Now you, you have uh, this unique experience going to shape your life. So why don't you tell us a little about that? So I entered into this uh, store or, or uh, kind of showroom where there was knives on every side. Uh, and f for the briefest moments, I was all by myself. There was no st storekeeper right. in, in the shop. And in Japan, uh, for those of your listeners who've been there, there's these sliding glass doors that you, yeah. you know, slide from the right to the left or left to the right, rather than a door that opens by pushing it in. Right. Right. Yeah. So I slid the door open. Of course, it was pretty creaky and noisy as the little <laughs> bearings underneath were squeaking and then closed the door. And I thought, how could anyone <laughs> not know that I'm here because I made such a racket <laughs> getting in? And yet, you know, for a few moments, I was all by myself and just looking around and wonder, wondering who was going to come through the door. Right. And were they going to be friendly or foe? <laughs> chase me out. Maybe they were going to chase me out with a big knife. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, out, uh, out comes this, uh, this, uh, gentleman, Mr. Yasuyuki Sakimoto, and he, he had a big smile on his face and he was very surprised that he had this gaijin standing in his shop, <laughs> a, a young blonde, you know, 18 year old, yeah, you know, I, right. I probably looked like a child at the time, yes, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just one step removed from a child. Right. And definitely in terms of language ability and cultural understanding, most definitely an infant. Right, right. Did, now, right. Did you, I know you learned the language, but how much did you understand the language at that time? Oh, at this point, nothing. Nothing, nothing. Absolutely okay. nothing. I, yeah. you know, I knew karate words that were all I knew, and I didn't know how to <laughs> apply them, right? It probably would have looked pretty bad if I had like just dropped into one of the positions and started punching in the air and yelling out the different names that we called them in class, right? It would have been very impressive. That would not be, no, yeah. that could have been a problem, yeah. He might, he might have chased me out with a knife. Had yes, I, I would say. He has yeah. weapons and, and probably knew martial arts himself, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, he, he had this big smile on his face, and I said, hello, and he said, hello, and... <laughs> 
and he gestured for me to sit down. There was there was a little there was a uh, uh, a little table in the middle of the shop with these little stools where when uh, you know longtime patrons would come into the shop who had business other than just getting their knife sharpened or buying a new blade. Right. You know they wanted to talk about the weather, talk about the sports. Yeah. You know yeah. basically friends. When friends would drop in or or preferred customers. They'd sit down. They would yep. be served a glass of cold mugicha tea in the summer, uh-huh. or hot tea in the winter, and possibly a coffee. And uh, you sit down and you chat. So he gestured for me to sit down there, and uh, I can't remember exactly moment by moment how that unfolded, but I'm sure I was probably like looking around wow. the yes, shop yes, yeah. and kind of awestruck, yeah. while at the same time thinking. Hmm, how am I going to have a conversation now that I'm <laughs> here yes. in this shop? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's... But uh, I, I think I immediately, you know, picked up on his warmth and his yeah, friendliness yeah, yeah. and his desire to communicate. And uh, you know, he'd been to college, so he spoke a few words of English. Okay. And uh, I think I think judging with the fact that 30 years now down the road, we're, we're still very tight and very close. Mm-hmm. I yeah. would imagine that first encounter uh, probably stuck the, struck the right chord. Yes, it must have, because yeah. your, your, your journey is closely tied to him for years to come. So that's, that's pretty amazing. So what, what, what was the journey after that? After you guys struck it, hit it off, and then what was next? Uh, I, you know, I think I came and visited a couple of times, but when things started to get really serious was after I had been to a, an academic year at college at British, at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Okay. And while I was a student, I had a job at a sushi restaurant mm-hmm. at, the, at the sushi bar, at, right there at the counter, primarily making roll sushi. Right. Making the, what they call it, makimono, and you know okay. the, uh, everyone's familiar with the California roll and etc. Yes, and that whole time, that whole academic year, I kept thinking to myself, I really want to learn blacksmithing. Yeah, I think I've met the perfect person to teach me, right. Right. Mr. Sakimoto. I'm he. I'm pretty sure he'd welcome me back if I went mm-hmm. back to his shop again. Yeah. So there were a lot of kind of quiet, lonely, introspective moments while I was rolling sushi when I was trying to envision my future and piece together a plan for the rest of my life. And my thoughts would often go to, yeah, I can go back to Mr. Uh, Sakimoto's and and get in the forge and learn how to hammer steel. And, uh, you know, I I thought that learning to make knives was a pretty optimistic Uh, dream and and I thought maybe in reality what would be probably closer to the truth would be just learning how to sharpen knives right, and maybe right. repair the occasional mm-hmm. blade and then make some rudimentary tools like shovels and spades and pickaxes yes, yes. things like that yeah. for for maybe some kind of a farming future perhaps yeah <clears throat> excuse me but uh, you know I I was longing for the day that I would go back to Japan yeah. and uh, revisit Mr. Sakimoto and undertake the study of blacksmithing and bladesmithing in seriousness. Right, right. And so you, that was, that, that whole year, you just, that's what you wanted to do. And, and that's, so what, what brought you back? Because you, you went back for an extended time. How did you, how'd you manage that? And how did you work that in, into your plans? So during that one academic year, I was really fully immersed in the Japanese language. Yeah. Okay. And and, and uh, by extension, the culture and so on. And I had I was making uh, contacts and friendships yeah. with many Japanese people who who had visited North America that I met by uh, coincidence or accident. So I became very focused on getting back to Japan and establishing some sort of lifestyle there yes now the cold hard reality is is that uh while it's uh, you know cool and wonderful that i'm the quote unquote japanese uh, <laughs> bladesmith no, no one can start out that way right. living in japan for right. most for most of us uh non-japanese people if we want to uh, live and study in japan uh, it's usually going to revolve around teaching english 
in some right. capacity yes. or another. Yeah. Yeah. You know, unless you have some very a special skill and 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 you have some special uh, uh, business over in Japan. For the most of us, we end up teaching English. Yes. So I uh, I planned to open up my own little uh, English conversational school. Okay. It's just informal little school, not accredited. Mm-hmm. You know, basically just hang a hang a. Uh, a, a tile on the wall yep. uh, on the outside, you know, and, and say, Hey, I'm an English teacher. And, <laughs> and uh, I, I set up classes for elementary school kids yeah, and for yeah. uh, junior high school kids, high school kids, and then different classes for adults. And, it, and I certainly had no qualifications in teaching English as a second language. Right. I'd never studied how to teach uh, ESL, but uh, there were lots of guidebooks on how to do that successfully. And you know different curriculums to put together, different textbooks to use, mm. and so kind of like guidebooks written by uh, expats who had done that over in Japan. And and I was a voracious reader, and I was reading okay. everything I could about how to have a successful venture as an English conversation teacher in Japan. Right. right. So th- that was your ticket back, and then but you, how did you? Um, Reestablish your relationship with Mr. Sakimoto because that's yeah, yeah, pretty much right off the bat. As soon as mm. I got back to Japan, the second time I flew right back to Kumamoto, which mm. is where that karate school yes. was, and where mm. I had Mr. S- met Mr. Sakimoto, and where I had established a whole network of, of friends and acquaintances uh, from the nine month stint yes. that I did right. right. before. Yeah. So I flew back and uh, immediately set up the English conversation school, and that did pretty uh pretty well i i got enough enrollment within the first month or two to easily make a li- a monthly living wage oh wow yeah. and uh the beauty was is that that lifestyle of teaching english usually started after the kids got out of school right. so yeah. while you might have one or two adult students during the day yeah. predominantly your work day was from th- three in the afternoon until nine at night right Right. So you left, so left you the day. That, that left the day, every day open to uh, go to Mr. Sakimoto's shop mm-hmm. and to start the informal uh, process of learning yes. yeah. bladesmithing. Yeah. So that's fascinating, though, because in your journey, you, you're, you're definitely, I would say, adventurous, adventurous. I mean, you went to Japan and then you started your own business. Um, as an English teacher there. I mean, you have that, uh, and I know now you've built, you know, a, a, um, an amazing uh, company where unique, you know, unique pieces of work, of art, really. I mean, it's, it's a, they're knives and blades, but they're, it's artwork. Uh, but you have that, that entrepreneurial spirit that you, you just can, I mean, not too many people can just pick up and create, you know, like a, a business to survive. And you're at that time, 1920. Yeah. 1920. That's right. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm just glad you didn't tell me how unique and odd it was. <laughs> that's right. I might not have done it. That's I, exactly. Uh, <laughs> one, one, uh, one friend of mine, uh, in Japan, he was a, a French gentleman living in Japan. He said, Murray, you're, you're kind of like a bumblebee. <laughs> I said, well, what do you mean? Because I'm like buzzing around being busy. He said, no, he said, Murray, he said, scientifically, uh, because of the body size and weight of the bumblebee, the little tiny wings it has shouldn't physically be able to carry it through the air in flight. It's, 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 it's considered to be a, 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 a physical impossibility, but because no one bothered to tell the bumblebee that, that's right. he just keeps flying. <laughs> that's, that's a great analogy. Do you feel like that has been like your entire journey? I mean, how you developed... Uh, your, your, I mean, how you got there, how you got your business started, all that is just because you didn't, didn't know any different and started this long and, you know, the relationship. You know, I think for better or for worse, uh, you know, with all of my character strengths and character flaws, the one thing I will say is that I, I'm fairly in tune with my own heart. Yeah. And, yeah. and I've always kind of marched to my own drum, to right. my own beat to many people's chagrin and uh, for a lot of the things that I've done in my life, like studying karate, going to Japan, establishing my own uh, conversational school, uh, pursuing, pursuing traditional Japanese bladesmithing with not a single guarantee 
but I wouldn't be like the hundreds of other foreigners who have mm-hmm. pursued the traditional crafts like traditional pottery or traditional carpentry and who have all, you know, met with, you know, uh, a sad, mm-hmm. uh, uh, unfulfilled expectations because yeah. they never just, they never broke through that thick veil called Japanese society, you know, and they were, they were just forever on the outskirts or on the out, outside. Uh, I, I just pursued what I felt was right at the yeah. time for me. And uh, I've been very blessed that uh, while those character flaws that I, that I always had and I still have I still <laughs> come back to bite me when it comes to personal relationships and so on, in terms of a professional career. Yes, that's... Listening to my own heart has been immense, what many people would consider a success story. Right. right. And, and do you feel like that that's a foundational uh, characteristic to have to, to ha- find success or, or is that unique to you? <laughs> well, I think, yeah, I think it's probably uh, a common, a commonality amongst yeah. successful people is, right is uh, they're true to themselves. Yes. They have a good uh, awareness of their own uh, strengths and limitations physically, yeah. spiritually, and mentally, emotionally. And uh, I think they pursue something that gives them a great uh, sense of satisfaction and, and uh, a purposeful, purposefulness. Yes, yes. And, and because they stick with it and because it gives them innate joy, right, right. I think that they, they, uh, they can achieve greater things right. than, yeah. than other people. Yeah. yeah. That, that unique that pa- passion combined with hard work combined with no, like the ongoing uh, desire to learn because you know, you don't know everything that like takes people a long way, you know, because mm-hmm. that, that passion keeps you going. The hard work gets things accomplished and, and um, that, that trying to seek the knowledge you don't have will, will keep you going on the right path. That's, that I would let's not agree. forget some of the lucky breaks too. I think yes. Yes. immensely lucky that I met Mr. Sakimoto. Yes. Who is kind mm-hmm. and generous mm-hmm. and uh, you know, very open right. Right. with uh, with his skills and techniques and sharing everything he knew with me. So I know your journey. You you spent many what it was 12, 13 years. How long did you spend with him? Well, I was in Japan for what I tell people is a total of 18 years, 18, but to be right. technically correct, we need to take out the year and a little bit that I was at University of British Columbia. Right. But since I was involved in intensive Japanese language and culture yes. study, I consider that part of my yes. Japanese yes. experience. Yes. Uh, but I, I was kind of intensely involved with Mr. Sakimoto for 16 years. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. Well, I was in Japan and then every year since then. So 28 of the past years, I've had a, a, an in-depth personal That's relationship with him. So it was, I, I, I was fascinated because I don't know many stories that you are a 17th generation as Yashimoto? Yo, Yoshimoto? Yoshimoto, so, mm-hmm. a blacksmith. I mean, to come over, as you say, uh, you know, as a, Caucasian coming over there from North America and being in the lineage of something that has, you know, over 400 years of history. I mean, that is, that's amazing. I don't know if I have heard of that happening before. So that, I mean, well, I mean, that's the lucky component as well, yeah, right? right? It could, it could have just as easily have been, I met Sensei Sakimoto mm-hmm. who was first generator, generation bladesmith. And now I'm second generation yeah. bladesmith. <laughs> and between the two of us, we've got 50 years of bladesmithing right, right, history. Right. It, it could have easily have been. Yes, there. right, right. But for some reason, you had that chance encounter, however you, you want to put it. If it was fate, whatever, you had that encounter. And it took your initiative to go in the store, your initiative to come back. I mean, obviously, there is there's luck involved in a lot of things, but it takes somebody to get action to happen for that luck to happen so that's yes. that's yeah. very very fascinating mm-hmm. so, so you you did that and you you have you what um was the decision you came back to the north america to oregon and you started your own um company so what was that what kind of drove you that direction 
Sure, sure. While living in Japan, I left Japan in 2005 to immigrate here to the United States of America. But many years uh, prior to that, as a bladesmith, I was uh, making the finest collection of, of knives I could and then taking them to different trade shows around the world. Right, right. I actually only ever went to France and I only ever went to North America. So it, it, I say around the world, but it's only <laughs> those two destinations. It covers a lot of it. but yeah, yeah. I mean, there were, there were trade shows in, uh, in Milano and in Frankfurt and in Australia, uh, just to some that I knew of, but I, I never did participate in those. I never had, the, I couldn't make the timing work for me personally. But uh, I was taking the finest knives I could that I felt represented my best work. And I would go to these trade shows that usually would last between two and three days, usually held over a weekend. You would sell your knives there to patrons who also often traveled around the world right. to be there at that yes. venue. Yes. Certainly that's the case at the world's most prestigious knife show, the Blade Show, which is held in Atlanta, Georgia, every year in June. Okay. You know, people would travel from around, literally around the world with, uh, you know, huge pockets of cash. You know, this is back in, back in the 90s, yeah. right? Yeah when a lot of people who were involved in the custom knife world didn't accept credit cards, they yeah. cash a check. I mean, that's, right. that was the currency at the time. Right. And the result of those shows was uh, that I, that many customers expressed uh, strong support for what I was doing for my work, for yeah. my work ethic, uh, for the whole concept of carrying on with the traditional Japanese bladesmithing and so on. Enough so that I thought that, uh, you know, United States was really center stage for the handmade, handcrafted, certainly blade world. That's probably true in some other right. crafts industries as well. And uh, just tremendous support here that people showed in both accolades and by purchasing my product. Right, right. So I really, I felt a strong connection and link to the United States and decided that uh, it'd be great to bring the whole bladesmithing operation here. Yeah. Okay. So that, and, and that, and that began, you know, your company Carter Cutlery, correct? Right. And, that, and that was, and what has that journey been like for you? Uh, so we, we, it took, I think back in 2001, so well, I have a funny story. In 2001, I started the process to immigrate to the United States as a Canadian citizen living in Japan right. based on my bladesmithing credentials. Right. And I remember calling up the Immigration and Naturalization Services from Japan and I said, <coughs> excuse me, I called from Japan and I said, look, uh, I, I think I'd like to move to the United States around 2005 and I don't but I'm not. But I don't think I'll be ready to move to the United States until about 2005. So I don't want to apply for this thing too soon, and then get it too soon, and then have everything you know be be fast forwarded. Right, and, right. And the guy on the phone laughed. He said, "Dude, you got absolutely nothing to worry about. It's going to take you way longer than, than you think." You might. He said, "You better get your application in right away." Yeah. So that you might be able to plan for 2010, let alone 2000. <laughs> <Right. laughs> so that was a bit of a wake-up call. Like I just thought, well, I'll apply, and a few months later, yeah, I'll get ready to go. paperwork, <laughs> and away it goes. You know that again. That's youth, right? You know, yes, yes. High empathy of youth, even though at that time I was 20 in my early 20s. Yes, Maybe, no, late. I was in my late 20s at that time. Right. So, uh, so we started the paperwork and. Uh, Got you know made some headway getting applications in doing the the obligatory uh, you know uh, 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 physical checkups and getting those results submitted and then in two thousand and three well before we really had any word whether we'd be able to get these green cards to come work right. in the United States uh, my wife at the time and I with our two children we traveled to Oregon okay. and uh, it was in the spring yep. it was gorgeous and just the the colors were beautiful yeah. and everything was lush and green because of all the waterfall we get yeah. in the winter <laughs> and the people seemed to be really really uh different and unique 
in yeah. a very kind and outgoing and gregarious way. Yeah. Yeah. And we immediately liked Oregon and then we started shopping for a house. Wow. And then I think uh, that must have been maybe a 2002 because I think in 2003 I actually bought a house. Okay. In in, in rural uh, in rural Oregon a place called Vernonia. Okay. Which is roughly 1 hour as the crow flies northwest of Portland. Okay. Yeah, towards Astoria or towards the the bottom corner of Washington. State. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and then it was in 2004, I actually got denied the whole visa process oh, gosh. to, 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 to move to and live and work in the United States. Oh, and I'm thinking, wait. man, I just bought a car. I no. bought a house. <laughs> house what am car. I going to do? <laughs> so that was a, that was a, a big surprise, a big, uh, shakeup. And, uh, I really had to, uh, get the lead out and, uh, I had to do some fast thinking on my feet and uh, appeal their initial decision and uh, supply a lot more evidence supporting this concept that I was actually an alien of extraordinary ability. <laughs> Basically, the uh, refusal letter that I got was, the denial letter was, Murray, it's clear that you and Carter Cutlery uh, are a successful business and you have a unique story and that you are on the way to the top, but you're not there yet. And this visa is for people who are in the top one or two percentile of their industry. Oh my gosh. I applied for a very specific visa called yes. Alien of Extraordinary Ability. Oh gosh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, they just, uh, Terry Iwe, the, uh, the, the gentleman who was working in Nebraska for Immigration and Naturalization Services, who was my caseworker, yep. He, I think very fairly, he examined all the evidence that I had submitted. Uh, and he saw I was on the way to the top, but not quite there yet. And so wasn't deserving of this really, wow. really special visa. Well, the truth of the matter is I hadn't actually submitted everything that I could have submitted as evidence right. for all of like the original uh, contributions I had made in the industry or right, right. in what ways my story really was truly unique. and. Uh, and so when I saw by his very detailed denial letter, by reading between the lines of what was missing instead of what I had has sub submitted, I did a quick brainstorming. I had 30 days to appeal the decision. Yep. I pulled out all the stops and I didn't create anything that wasn't factual, but I really, I, you know, I pulled in every single little last bit of evidence that would yep. convince him. Yep. And like 20 days later, we got the letter. We oh, gosh. on re-examination of your case. <laughs> you. and Upon consideration of the new evidence, we, 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 uh, we're going to grant you and your family green cards to immigrate to the United States. Oh, that's immigrants. Yeah. So that was, have you ever heard of, you hear of people like dancing a jig? Yes. that was. I, I literally, I literally. <laughs> you danced a jig. A jig. <laughs> On the spot when I opened up that letter. Oh, and yeah. uh, it was cause for great celebration that night. That, that would, yes. That's, I mean, you poured everything into it. Your plans you know, your future plans are tied to it. That, that would have been a big day. Yeah. Big day. yeah. So, it, was, it was that whole visa, that whole visa application process and all the work I had to do made coming to North America that much more worthwhile. Yes. Yeah. Had it been easy, you know, just put in a phone call yeah. to an uncle and say, Hey, <laughs> give me my visas. You know, right, right, right. It, it wouldn't have held as much value to me. So, right. I definitely see a connection for, you know, in, in my life. And I think it's the whole truth for other people. I think the more effort you put into something, yeah. Yeah. the greater the reward. Right. Yeah. And do you find that in, um, I know that's in life, but that's in business also. Have you found that with, uh, with Carter Cutlery also? Yes, because right now I'm experiencing a new uh, kind of challenge that I've never experienced in 30 years of my career. And that is for, for, for the first 10 years, I would maybe take in a, a young uh, apprentice to help me with the grinding of the knives and yep. setting up at, at shows and moving equipment around and so on and so forth, usually kind of on a part-time basis and progress from there to a full-time assistant. Had a full-time assistant for years. We still kept the business. We ran the business in the family, so the yeah. wife at the time running, doing the books, right, right, right. Uh, dealing with, uh, dealing with uh, suppliers and so on. 
Uh, and then the next big jump was getting uh, an, uh, the first office administrative assistant. Right. But I still operated with one assistant and one uh, apprentice for years and years and years. But in the past two and a half years, we've grown the business and now we have nine employees. Right, right. So now. And the, the challenges of dealing with the different personalities and their unique needs and, and trying to uh, capitalize on their unique talents without draining them and making them, you know, so that they can feel uh, challenged and rewarded by that and also feel positive about contributing to the, the, the umbrella of a larger company. That right now has presented a new set of yeah. unique challenges which uh, I, I, I feel like I'm 18 years old. Yes, you're doing, you're doing and it navigating all Navigating through those. <laughs> That, that, that is a challenge, managing people and, and personalities. Did the, uh, just, was it just a demand that, that allowed, I mean, that caused you to expand? I mean, the demand for your, for the knives, I mean, your products? Uh, I had this one apprentice for 13 years mm. from the time when I was, up in Vernonia. And he, I took him in under our wing when he was just 15 years old and, you know, uh, shared with him all the skills and knowledge that I had. And, uh, he, uh, he was trying to navigate his world, th- his way through life. And so he would work for a couple of years. He would go off and try something else. And then, uh, I'd call him up after a year or two, see how he's doing. And yeah, yeah. if he wasn't doing so well, I'd say, well, why don't you come back and <laughs> we'll make more knives together. And on and off that went for, 13 years. Yeah. And uh, about three years ago, I asked him if he was staying busy with his new job. And he said he'd been sitting on the sofa for the past six months. I said, well, okay. why don't you come back? And instead of being my assistant, where sometimes we were, you know, butting heads, yes. Yes. why don't you just make knives all on your own? I think after 13 years, you, you can you, do it. Yeah. For the most part, I think you could do it now. Yeah. And just with a little bit of supervision from me, uh, you know, we can make that successful. And then you yeah. can, We'll market your knives under a different brand name with your own unique mark on it, and, and then we'll split the profits. Right, right. And uh, and we started that, and uh, it kind of it kind of took off took off all on its own. This idea right. of uh, having guys come in, train them up, having the senior journeyman train up the new apprentice. Yeah. So it wasn't all on me. Right. I would just oversee this whole process. Yeah. And watch these young artisans train up and, and, and create new artisans. And uh, that kind of became, uh, and it took on an identity of its own yes. yeah. an entity of its own. Sorry. Right. Right. So currently we have three uh, journeyman bladesmiths who have all uh, graduated a very intense three month uh, uh, tr- kind of trial period, kind of like I call it the Navy SEALs training of the bladesmith <laughs> Yeah. High attrition rate, you know, over fifty percent attrition, right. even right. for people we vet coming into the program. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if they make it through the program, they get their own stamp. They make their own knives, right. and then we we market them uh, under their brand, Muteki Knives, and uh, they get to kind of create their own style, their own uh, their own following, yeah. and they kind of create their own market for their own creations but without any of the risks of having to set up their own shop right right and then once you get all these knives and you need someone who's going to photograph them and measure them <laughs> and put them up online and price them and then you need somebody else who's going to be able to answer the phone so th- so what one administrative assistant used to right. do we now have three individuals sure. doing yeah yeah and then we have the three the three uh, journeyman smiths we've got a fourth who's starting in a couple of weeks and then I have two personal assistants. Where I used to have one a personal assistant, mm-hmm. I now have two personal assistants <laughs> helping me uh, complete my knives in right, right. the shop. So I forge them and someone else sandblasts them. Right. And then I cold forge them and then someone else scribes them out and cuts them out and grinds them. Then I heat treat them and then they rough grind the, the secondary edge mm-hmm. and then I final polish the secondary edge and put the final cutting edge on and then someone else puts the handle on. Yeah. So that's our division of labor in the shop. Sure. What is fascinating is that your background where you were trained up and 
Mr. Uh, Sakimoto poured into you. Now you're doing that. You continue that on where you're giving other people opportunity to, to have um, a career, a business, a lifestyle like, uh, like you, you got, that's just, that's pretty neat. It's, that's a, like a kind of giving back to what you received early on in your life. Yeah. I, I, I've never made this analogy before, but making a knife is very much about taking basically a useless chunk of steel. Yeah. It might be the world's best steel, but the form that it's in currently, it's useless. It's of no good to anybody except a paperweight. And, and forging it through time and, and temperature and pressure and hammer blows uh, and a little bit of blood sweat and tears, <laughs> we, we make a very useful and valued tool yes. that enhances yeah. people's yeah. lifestyle. Yeah. And in a similar way, although it's probably not fair to compare you know, a, a human to a tool, <laughs> uh, <laughs> although a lot of people use that derogatory <laughs> term. <laughs> in this case, we're going to use it in a positive it's way. A positive, this is a positive you know, way. We're, ta- we're taking young men and women yeah. who, who have an aspiration uh, but no uh, uh, sellable bladesmithing yeah. skills, yeah. and through time and patience and, and instruction and their share of blood, sweat, and tears, we're, we're transforming them into talented, passionate, caring artisan bladesmiths. Yes, yeah. yeah. That, that I think have very much use That's, in the world. That's a very good analogy. I like that. I like that. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to... And with a couple of questions that I kind of I like to ask everybody, um, I'm going to craft them a little different uh, to f- kind of fit your your journey. But uh, what do you have any routines in your life, uh, morning routine, day routine, to keep um, all the things that you're juggling with the people you're dealing with, the, the business, you have family. Do you have any routines throughout the day that keep you on track? Uh. I do like to go to bed at the same time every day, which is 930 at night. Okay. I feel that that's an early enough hour that uh, if you end up sleeping until seven in the morning, you've gotten an amazing night's sleep. Yeah. <laughs> and if you need to get up at six o'clock, yeah. you still feel like you've had a good night's sleep. Right. That's a big, that's a big change because I used to not even consider bedtime until the clock past 12. Right. Right. So 9.30 is a big change. And, and uh, since I don't really watch TV, uh, I don't really feel like I'm missing anything. Right. Yeah. Or if you want to catch one show, you know, after dinner or whatnot. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, as far as routines go, I'm not uh, all that disciplined at keeping this routine, but I do like to get in some exercise three yes. or four times a week. Right. And sometimes it's a little bit more, and then sometimes months will pass. And I don't do it. But what I can tell you is, I, I wish it was a daily routine because when I do it, everything in my world is better. Right, right. right. And, and I know that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I guess at 48, I don't quite have that figured out completely. And maybe by the time I'm 58, I'll have it down. Yeah, big... <laughs> <a routine. laughs> no, that's great. Right, and, and, and my last question, you, what would be one piece of advice you giving somebody that is out there that wants to find their passion in life like you found um what what advice would you give them to to kind of be able to figure that out well we know for years people have been saying follow your passion and yeah. that can be not always a great advice because people can go down a road that they think they want to go down, but they might not have any innate skills there and that they can be met with serious disappointment. Uh, And of course, you know, you can't give up your security of, of, of a good place to live and finances by doing things rat by making rash decisions. So I certainly wouldn't want to give anybody advice that could in the long term negatively impact their, their life. But I mean, we all need, we, I mean, one of the few things we really need is good health. Yeah. We need security. We want to be surrounded by people we know who love and appreciate us. And I think focusing on those fundamentals first will allow you to then secondarily start branching out and then looking and experimenting with other things mm. in, in the hopes that after a lifelong 
pursuit of trying all sorts of different things, talking to different people, uh, you know, that you might find something that you can really gravitate towards. Right. So I think the perspective needs to be long-term and not, okay, quit your job, move to the other side of the country yes. and pursue uh, uh, landscape paintings because that's what I always want yeah. to do. I think, yeah. I think that could be a recipe for disaster. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and the, and the importance of good health can't be overestimated, right. you know, staying in shape, getting enough sleep mm-hmm. so that when it comes to making day-to-day decisions, yeah. you're always kind of making decisions in a positive direction and not continually painting yourself yeah. emotionally, financially, spiritually, or, uh, whatever into a corner. That's great advice. The good, good health and, and not being rash about decisions being very thoughtful and and uh and and having a a plan in place instead of just uh, jumping to the to the next thing to the next thing and Um, and to that and to that end just as one last thought one thought i'm having recently that i think is very sound advice that people can immediately apply to their lives is to start thinking about food in terms of what will make you feel good four hours from now uh-huh. versus what is going to taste good in the next 10 minutes. Right, right. That's really, that's excellent. That, and that is a, um, well, I always, we use it in, in my house. I always talk about um, f- food is fuel. So when you put bad fuel in your body, you know, it might energize you for a little bit, but then that fuel runs out pretty quick and then you don't feel so good. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so if somebody wants to find out more about you or our or Carter uh, Cutlery, where would they go? So we have a, a, a large internet presence at cartercutlery.com. That's perfect. They can also, we've got over 180 videos on YouTube oh. under Murray Carter or Carter Cutlery. Okay. Some are instructional, some are entertaining. Uh there's something a little bit of there for everybody. And we also have a Instagram account okay. and Facebook as well. Okay. And that under Carter Cutlery or Murray Carter? Uh, anything business related is under Carter Cutlery. Carter Cutlery. Awesome. Awesome. That's great. Well, Murray, I can't thank you enough. I loved hearing your journey. I loved getting more in depth in, in, in this in the last few, few moments here. Um, I appreciate you just taking the time to to share with us today. Well, Greg, it's been a pleasure. And, uh, you know, I wish you and your podcast and your energy bar uh, <laughs> enterprise every bit of success. And we're happy to uh, try them out here in Oregon and, awesome. and give you some feedback. That's uh, great. And you can, you know, fuel. if they're too, you know, if you want to share them with other people, you can chop them up with your knives and you can give them to all kinds of people. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, thank you so much. You have a wonderful day. Yeah, thank you very much, Greg.